So good evening, everyone. My name is Karim Atif, and I'm the chair of the Dubaiism branch in Egypt. Welcome to the eighth Dubaiism branch meeting in Egypt. So our guest speaker today is Andy Farrell. Uh, Andy is both a fellow member of the Dubaiism and a chartered member of the IOSH. He also holds membership of the Institution of Industrial Accent Investigation and Investigators and the membership of the Institute of Leadership and Management. And he is accredited as a health and safety consultant with the UK Occupational Safety and Health Consultant Register. In addition, not only does he have a wealth of practical experience in investigative interviewing and safety management, but he has also written a book on interview techniques, investigative interviewing, a practical guide for managers. So our agenda for today's meeting will be firstly, I will speak about our branch updates. After that, we will listen to Andy, who will be presenting on the role of senior management in the incident investigation process, which is the third in series of webinars on incident interviewing. Finally, there is a Q&A session. So if you have any comment regarding to the topic of the webinar, feel free to submit it in the question box and we will answer all your questions before the end of the meeting. Regarding to our branch updates, the 2022 IIRISM Risk Excellence Awards, the IIRISM Awards celebrate risk excellence and all those who contribute to protecting people, reputations and profits. The awards identify those organizations, teams and individuals that champion better risk and safety management to drive organizational and employee well-being. The awards, as said before, are independent and free to enter for both the IIRISM members and the members. Whether you work for a large multinational with big budget and lots of resources, or an SME or a charity with a small budget and limited resources, the principles and the benefits of effectively managing risk equally apply. The Risk Excellence Awards synonymy will, uh, will again take place virtually uh, for this year from 5 to 6 p.m. British Standard Time on uh, 19th of May 2022. With over 500 people from around the globe joining us last year, we are hoping for an even greater night in 2022. It's free to attend and great fun. So if you are available in this time, please book your place to attend this ceremony. Julie will also share the link in the chat box for how to uh, register or how to attend this event. The One Person Saver Purser Scheme. If you are a risk and safety professional based in Egypt but not a member of the IIRISM, you can apply for a one-year free membership of the IIRISM at affiliate uh, level. The IIRISM is reopening applications for the One Person uh, Saver Purser until the end of May as uh, they have still some few places for this bursary. This gives you access to a wealth of tools and resources to support your professional journey in the risk and safety management. Memberships are limited and only available for a limited amount of time. So please complete your application form and submit it to membership by the 31st of May uh, 2022. Regarding to our future branch meeting, the Double IRISM Egypt branch meetings, as said before, will be delivered on a monthly basis. The next meeting will be on the 14th of June. The topic and the speaker will be confirmed shortly. And regarding to the CBD and training opportunities that we will deliver, the Double IRISM will deliver an online workshop about the CDM and building safety. This interactive virtual workshop will help delegates to understand the holistic approach to procurement and design with client engagement. Delegates will learn how to demonstrate good and compliant design through the project design say, uh, risk management process. The workshop takes place over two sessions on consecutive days, starting at 9 a.m. UK time and finishing at 12 p.m. The upcoming dates are 24th and 25th of May. For more information about this workshop and how to register, Julie will also help uh, by sharing the link in the chat box. Also, the IIRISM will deliver a professional development event on the 
uh, 18th of May. Donna Gordon and Hugh Maxwell will be presenting on how to apply for the Double Irism Fellowship. So for more information about this event and how to register, we will share the link on the chat box. Regarding to the international branch meetings, uh, there will be three upcoming international branch meetings will be delivered in May. The first one is, is the UAE branch meeting, which will be on the 11th of May. And the second one is India branch meeting, which will be on the 25th of May. And the last one is Qatar branch meeting, which will be on 24th of May. Regarding to the UK branch meeting, there will, there will be also three upcoming UK branch meetings will be delivered in May. The first one is Scotland branch meeting, which will be on the 18th of May. Raymond Poon will be presenting on CDM managing contractors. The second one is London branch meeting, which will be also on the 18th of May. Craig Davis will be presenting on Legionella and risk management. The third one is Ireland branch meeting, which will be on the 26th of May. So you can visit the IRISM website to find out more information about the mentioned meetings, along with how to register for uh, those events. So that's the update regarding to our branch. So now I will hand over the meeting to Andy who will be presenting on the role of senior management in the accident investigation process. So you can go, Andy. Thank you, Karim, and welcome, everybody. My thanks to IRSM Egypt for the invitation to come back yet again. It's my third session now. I'm quite enjoying it. So, yeah, we're, we're carrying on looking at various topics about management role uh, with incident investigation and incident management. And... What I want to look at tonight is the role of senior management in the incident investigation process. Um, obviously, it's a complicated subject. Uh, time is a bit limited, but we'll just go through what I hope are the essentials. But as has been said, any queries, please put your questions into the chat box and we'll try to deal with them as we can. And what's happened previously, if we were out of time, then the organisers will send me a list of the questions and I'll send the answers back and they'll distribute them. So one way or another, we'll answer your questions. So let's carry on. Does the technology work? Yes, it does. So what we'll look at is the role of senior management before and after the incident investigation process. Now, obviously time, as I say, is limited. But what we're going to look at is the role of the senior management team, the SMT, in the context of preparing the investigation framework, supporting the investigation team, what they do during the investigation itself, the duty, the role of the senior management team in responding positively to the investigation findings, and then I want to look at what I think is one of the major challenges that the, the senior management team will face once the inquiry has been concluded. So the first thing is preparing the framework. Now, many companies take what you might term the, the easy way out in that they delegate incidents to a junior manager normally the health and safety manager, who may not be very senior in the overall management framework. So it's a junior manager. And that can be a serious mistake for a number of reasons. First of all, the investigation itself may require more than one person to be involved. Take, for example, the classic case of somebody hit by a forklift truck in the warehouse and sustained serious injuries. You need somebody to examine the accident scene and get the data from that as to what the, the scene can tell you. But you also need somebody to speak to the witnesses as soon as possible because you need to get their re recollections and reactions before they lose them. So that's two people. That's just to start with. So just having one person to investigate a scene, uh, investigate 
a serious accident on their own is going to be a mistake. Also, if the junior person mishandles the investigation, and they can do it because they're just not experienced, then that can cause critical damage to the company's reputation and to its finances via fines and compensations. And the main thing is, of course, that a flawed investigation, that's going to leave the organisation open to a risk of a repeat incident. You've got to get as much information as possible, find out what really happened so you can stop it happening again. And that is a point to make, that the, the whole aim of an investigation is not to find somebody to blame or to hold responsible or to have them publicly executed or whatever. No, that's a side issue. The main idea is that you find out what happened so you can stop it happening again to protect the people and to protect the company. So it has to be done properly. So the role of the senior management team is to develop the whole investigation framework, and we'll look at some of the details of that in a minute. And you need to put that in place before you have an accident. Now, you, one can envisage a situation where you start putting the emergency plan together as the ambulance pulls up outside the factory. Um, that's not the best way of doing things. You need to have a plan so if something happens, people need to know what to do, where to go, who to speak to. It's not a new idea. People do it already. For example, if there's an IT failure, then they know who to ring in the IT department. The IT department know where to get additional equipment from, how to switch servers over, and so on. It's already been planned. So all I'm saying is, is that you take that same approach to investigations. Have a framework in place. So some of the topics that this framework will cover, starting at the top, will be, well, which person from the senior management team, from the SMT, is going to act as what I call the nominated senior manager, the NSM, who will support the investigation. Now, we'll look in a minute at what the, S the NSM will actually do, but you need to have somebody to take that role on. So you need to know, how is this person going to be selected? And what skills and qualities will they need? For example, they're going to support the investigation. They're going to support the lead investigator. So this nominated manager needs to be an analytical thinker who doesn't jump to conclusions or run off on a tangent. Somebody who can sit down and think logically. And not everybody can do that. They have to be neutral. Rather than simply, I'm looking for somebody to blame, they've got to accept the information as it comes in and treat it as it should be treated, without fear or favour. They look at it, they analyse it. And also, and this could be difficult in some cases, they've got to be able to respect the opinions of others, regardless of the other person's rank or status. So the NSM may be a very senior manager, but you get into a meeting with the investigation team, and a junior investigator is saying, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Sosa, that's wrong. We can't do that. You've made a mistake. He's got to be prepared to listen rather than simply, I'm the manager, I know what I'm doing. So there are skills there, and not every senior manager will have these skills, but they've got to be selected to head up the investigation. Next question is, once you've worked out who's going to take overall charge, then how is the whole investigation team going to be structured? And remember, I've already pointed out, you're likely to need more than one person, probably at least two, maybe a lot more. So where are you going to get this team from? Will it be purely internal from the company's resources? Or will you simply use an external specialist? Or would you do both? 
certain that there are arguments for and against each of these approaches, but it's got to be thought about. So if things suddenly go wrong, you've got an idea of where you're going to get help. Who's going to be in the investigation team? Now here I think we come across a very common mistake. And that is to use the departmental manager as the investigation lead because he's got authority, it's his department, he knows how it works, he knows the systems, he knows the people. So with that simple approach, that seems to be a good idea. But remember, the incident that he's investigating may actually be due to him. Well, it may be that he has, without realizing, either done something or failed to do something, which has led to the incident. I'm not saying he knows, he may not even realize what happened, but the reality may be that his error has caused the incident. So you're asking him to investigate his own actions and inactions, and you can't put somebody in that position. It's not fair on them, it's not fair on the company. So you need somebody to lead the investigation who is in fact um, neutral, they're not directly involved. A one possibility, for example, if it's a, a warehouse you're thinking about, if you've got more than one warehouse, then can you use another warehouse manager to lead the investigation? So what skills and experience do the team members need? Well, they've got to be able to work with others. They've got to be able to cooperate. They've got to respect other people's opinions. So they're not always gonna be, I'm right, you're wrong, but they will listen. But then again, there's the balance. If they think the other person is wrong and they are right, then they will express that opinion honestly. And that may mean that you've got, say, four people in the team, three of them are saying it's answer A, and one person is saying, I can't go along with that, I think it's answer B. And they've got to have the strength of character to do that, to, to do what they think is right. Again, not everybody is built like that. What training then are these team members going to need? Because you can't just drop them into an investigation and say, there you go, somebody's being run over with a forklift truck, go and sort it out. That's not fair on them, and you're not going to get very far. You'll get an answer of some kind, but poison the right one. So they need to have training in how to actually investigate. So who's going to provide it? I mean, you may have staff within the organization who've got a background that could do this. Maybe your security manager is, say, ex-police or ex-military intelligence or some such. So he'll have experience in, in investigations, or you may have to go external. But you need to think about it. They've got to have the tools to do the job. They may also need um, access to budgets. A contingency budget but it may be that during the investigation they find they need specialist advice from outside the company that advice from a specialist will come at a price so where are they going to get the money from if they've got to have the forklift truck examined by a specialist company an engineering company then who's going to pay for that who's going to pay for hiring the replacement forklift truck in the interim the money's got to come from somewhere. So ideally, there should be a budget set aside uh, to give them a, a fighting chance. And you've got to decide how much is then in that budget and how will access be controlled? Who will make the financial decisions within the team? What level of authority are the team going to have? Now, this is a contentious issue. You know, some of these people could be fairly junior when you look at the overall management hierarchy, and yet they've got to investigate, they've got to ask questions, and they're entitled to have answers. Answers which may actually embarrass the person who's being questioned. Well, that's unfortunate, but it's got to be done. So ideally, they will report directly to this nominated senior manager. 
so they can jump straight up the hierarchy. But how will people know about this? If you've got a large organization, how will all the managers, supervisors, departmental heads and so on, how will they know how this works? How will they know this person coming in as part of the investigation team actually has the authority to ask them these questions, to demand to see these particular records and so on? How are you going to publicize your policy? If they do run into a problem, then this is where the, the uh, manager will step in, the nominated manager, this is one of his primary roles, will be to sort out the problems. He will have the official clout, the authority, to tell managers, including senior managers, that no, you will cooperate with my investigators. They know what they're doing, they've got my confidence. If they ask to see documents, you will show them those documents. So they will smooth the waters, as it were. Um, hopefully they wouldn't have to step in, but sometimes in the real world, it may actually happen. One of the things that has to be thought about at the very beginning, and this depends upon where you're actually operating because obviously different countries have got different um, legal procedures but certainly I'm referring here to what happens in the UK and it may be relevant in other countries may have similar uh, processes. The team may well need access to legal advice and I'm thinking here particularly what in the UK is referred to as legal professional privilege. Now the idea is that you can invoke this professional privilege and that protects documents and notes and discussions from external scrutiny. So, for example, in the UK, the HSC, the Health and Safety Executive, if legal professional privilege was applied uh, properly, then there'd be certain documents which, although they're normally entitled to see things, they would not be able to see. But it's a complicated legal issue and you need to get legal advice at the very beginning because you can't suddenly decide halfway through an investigation that all the reports you've written suddenly have legal professional privilege. They may not because the proper procedures may not have been followed before those reports were written. So you need advice potentially at the very beginning as to how you generate and protect information. As I say, that's the UK version, and there may well be other uh, versions in other countries. So you've got your team. You've decided who is the nominated manager with overall responsibility, acting as the, their guardian, if you like. You've got the team nominated, uh, trained. Lovely. How are you going to activate them? Because that's another key issue. Who will decide what criteria will you need before you actually decide to, as it were, hit the alarm and bring the team in? Because that's going to cause disruption. Let's say you've got three or four people uh, on the nominated team and they're coming in from different departments, maybe from different sites. So somebody's got to cover their duties while they're on investigation duties. So there's a lot of disruption involved. So who's going to make that decision and how? What's the procedure going to be? And again, do all the other departments know about it? When somebody says to his manager, sorry, I can't do this job. I've been called away to an accident investigation. Will his manager go, yeah, OK, fine, we'll just get on with it. Or will he start to scream, bang on the table and refuse to let him go? It's a problem you don't need. What procedures are going to be followed for out of hours incidents? So I'm talking here about operations that run 24 seven. Are you going to have some kind of on-call rotor for teams, senior managers and so on? And if you've got rotors, who's going to make sure they're kept up to date? There's nothing worse than call out rotors who've got the wrong name, wrong telephone numbers. How do you work out the size of the team that you're going to need? Because it depends on the on the actual side of the incident, you need some have some criteria in place. You don't want to bring in a team of six people because somebody fell down the stairs. Maybe one person could deal with that. But then again, if somebody's being run over by a forklift truck, you may need half a dozen. 
So you need to have some criteria beforehand as to when to bring, when to bring the team in. You can always drop team members out or bring more in if you're required, but you need a certain nucleus to make the investigation work. And then what facilities are they going to need? Um, you know, in terms of an office, in terms of investigative equipment, what I refer to as a go bag. So you've got the equipment in a box or in a bag, in a briefcase, where you've got digital cameras, tape measures, notepads, and so it's all there. Just open the bag and away you go. You're not scrabbling around the office trying to find a tape measure or can somebody lend me a digital camera or anybody got any spare biros. Now, this can happen. Will they need office support, admin support, telephone lines, IT, and so on? All this should be worked out beforehand. So if something happens, all the parts just come together very smoothly. So it's got, that's getting the system up and running. So when the investigation is actually in progress, the role now of the senior manager, this nominated senior manager, is essentially to stand on the sidelines. He does not get directly involved, but he acts as a sounding board. So the investigator, the lead, can talk to him to clarify his thoughts, to talk over his feelings and his ideas to get a second opinion. And that can help because it's very easy for an investigation to drift off track unless you constantly keep checking, how do I know where am I going? So for that, the manager, the senior manager, will act as what I call devil's advocate. And he will test, not trying to strip the investigator up, but he will test his assumptions, test his logic by saying things like, yeah, but how do you know? Where's the evidence? Where's the chain behind this? Or are you simply jumping to a conclusion? Because that can be dangerous. So that's his role, is to act as the mentor, if you like, to the lead investigator who's actually doing the investigation. The NSM must always be at arm's length from the investigation. No way should he get directly involved. He's neutral, he's an observer, he's a mentor, he's not an investigator. And if he feels or she feels they cannot take that role on, that they want to get involved, they want to start moving things around and getting things done their way, then they should step down because all they're going to do is skew the investigation. They should step down and let somebody else come in to take over the NSM role. As I say, the investigation itself, the NSM does not get involved. He remains on the sidelines. The only time you would get directly involved is if you get a problem with a lack of cooperation from another department for some reason. And that can happen, possibly because people just don't believe who the investigators are, or they start to protect their own little territories. And sometimes you need somebody from on high to put a foot down and say, no, stop messing people around, cooperate with the investigation. So the investigation runs and you get the findings coming in. And this is where it gets quite interesting. So the senior management team may be called upon to look at those findings and they may feel the need to apportion blame to one or more people. Sounds really simple. However, as I'll show, human error is an easy label to attach to somebody, but it's very rarely accurate. The point is that most people are trying to do their job. But sometimes, because of situations outside of their control, they make difficult circumstances and they're going to get it wrong. But they're doing their best. I think it's very rare that you will get an employee who basically doesn't care and thereby causes an accident. Yes, you will get them, I grant you but I would suggest that they are in the minority. Most people are trying to do the job, to do it properly. But for one reason or another, things have gone wrong. And I'll give you a couple of examples where it's very easy to blame the people, but it's not 
really their fault. They were doing what they could. So before they rushed to judgment, the senior management team should put themselves in the position of the person who was actually involved. I'll ask the question, what did that person know at the time? Remember, the management team have got the findings of the investigation. They know what happened. That's hindsight. But the person involved, what did they know when they were taking a particular course of action, which may have resulted in this incident? And what training, for example, did they get? Was it relevant to what they were asked to sort out? If you put somebody in a position which they're not trained and they do the best they can and get it wrong, you can't say it was your fault because they were trying the best they could. Now, there's a, a chappy called Decker. Um, that's which I think of his first name. I've got his book and I can't remember his first name. Sidney Decker, I think it is. He's actually a professor at one of the universities in Australia and he's a specialist in human behavior and human error. And he suggests that human error is a symptom of failures deeper within the operational system. Because he points out that when you're labeling people as being guilty of human error, you already know what happened, as I've said. The person involved doesn't know what's going to happen. And they may well have a very different view of things and they've got limited information. Could you blame them? It's so easy to stand back and say, well, anybody could see that that was going to happen. Yeah, you know that because it happened. Is it quite so obvious when you're actually in front of that situation, when it's developing rapidly and you're trying to keep up with it? It's not always quite so easy to see what's going on. So that is a key point that he makes is that human error, it's a label he thinks shouldn't be used, but human error is a symptom of failures deeper within the operational, within the management systems. Now, what I want to do is to look at two examples to, to illustrate this point. Um, they are, as somebody pointed out to me today, actually, when I was talking about this presentation, they're quite old cases, um, but human nature hasn't changed. And the reason why I think these cases are valid is they are, they illustrate the points I'm going to make very clearly, but they have been, the old but still valid, they've been fully investigated and reported, so we know what happened. And of course, because of passage of time, then any legal repercussions, any claims, counterclaims, so on, will all have been dealt with. So we can't inadvertently tread on somebody's toes by making comments about an ongoing case, which is the last thing I want to do. So these are old cases, but they do demonstrate the point. So the first one is American Airways Flight 587. So what happened there? This was in November 2001. Uh, in fact, it was just after the the Twin Towers disaster in, uh, in the USA. And this aircraft had just taken off from, uh, from New York. It hadn't long taken off when all of a sudden the pilots lost control and the aircraft came down in the Queens suburb of New York. 251 passengers and nine crew on the aircraft were all killed and five people on the ground were killed. Now, initially it was thought this was a, it was a bombing but in fact, it wasn't. What you've got in the photograph is the tail fin of the aircraft. Now, if you think of the aircraft on the ground, this is the bit of the back that sticks up in the air. <laughs> That's the tail fin. And on that, you've got the rudder, which is a panel that moves left to right, which helps to steer the aircraft at low speed, to, helps to turn the nose left or right, hence it's called the rudder. So that tail fin actually came off. It's found one and a half kilometers from the crash. But once that came off, the aircraft became unflyable and it went straight into the ground. The investigation, looking at all the data from the cockpit, it showed that the first officer, the co-pilot, 
had applied what's called excessive input to the rudder. So he stamped very hard on the left and right rudder pedals. So he's operating the rudder very dynamically. And he was doing that because they were flying through turbulence, through bumpy air, and he was trying to stabilize the aircraft. And it turned out that the forces that were generated on the tail by this rudder flipping left and right, because the speed the aircraft was going at, all those forces, the pressure on the tail was so great, it actually tore it off. And it ended up in the harbor. Now, initially, of course, the blame was on the first officer. You know, he was doing something which Airbus, when they were approached, said, you can't do that. And in fact, we tell the airlines, you can't do that. The tail fin is not designed for those pressures at those speeds. It's for low speed use, not for high speed use. And otherwise you pull the tail off as he did. So it looked like that the first officer had actually made a mistake, a fatal mistake. But what the investigators found was that this first officer, who hadn't long been qualified, he was an experienced pilot, but he hadn't long qualified on Airbus, on the type. He was flying an Airbus not so long before this incident with another captain. They had the same problem with turbulence, and the first officer was using the rudder pedals. And the captain asked him, why were you doing that? And he said, well, that's what they taught us at the flying school on the conversion course. That's what you do. So the investigators took hold of this because Airbus had told them categorically, you can't do that. And we've told the airlines you can't do that. So the investigators went back and they looked at the syllabus for this advanced flying course, the conversion course that the pilots were taking. And nowhere within that syllabus was there any mention of you don't use violent rudder inputs when the aircraft is flying because it's not designed for it. So this key information from Airbus about a, a key part of the design never went into the training. So when that first officer stood on the pedal, he was doing what he thought was right because with other types of aircraft, it would work. He didn't know it wouldn't work with their bus. And he and other people paid that mistake with their lives. Um, when the investigators realized what had happened, American Airlines, the airline involved, they immediately modified their training. So they took the point on board. So that's one example of it looks like it's pilot error, it's easy to blame, close the file, walk away. In actual fact, it wasn't. There was a substantial failure inside the system, which had the potential to cause a lot more deaths. The second case I want to look at is the collapse of the, the sinking, the capsize of the Herald of Free Enterprise car ferry. And this actually happened in March 1987, but there's still some points to be learned from it. This was operated by a company called Townsend Torreson, and it was leaving Zeebrugge in Holland, heading over for Dover. Um, regular run. And this was a car ferry, a design known as a roll roll, roll on, roll off. So the idea was you had the doors at the front. Let's call it the front and the back. Hang on, which way around it? No, that's at the back and doors at the front. Uh, Bannister. And the idea was they, they could both be opened when the ship was loading or unloading. So essentially, vehicles could drive in from one end and then drive out the other end when they got the destination. So there was no need to maneuver, which meant they could save space and get more vehicles on board because no maneuvering room required. It was a nice, simple operation. And it was an accepted way of doing things. However, on the night of this accident they were just leaving harbour at Zibruga and as they came out of the harbour into the North Sea the water of course got a little bit rougher and the ship flooded the car deck flooded and because it's a flat deck the water sloshed around water's heavy it made the ship unstable and it turned over on its side 193 passengers and crew died even though the ship did actually sink. It's now lying, you can see it there in the photograph, it's actually lying on the seabed. But because of the way it turned over, a lot of people were injured, a lot of people were killed. 
Why did the water flood the deck? Because it was sailing with the bow doors wide open. It had no bow. So when it hit the rough sea, water flooded in. There was a public inquiry about this and Mr. Justice Sheen found three major problems. First of all, a chap called the assistant boatswain, one of the junior managers, or junior officers, who should have closed the bow door, was actually asleep in his cabin. He'd gone into his cabin for a quick break while they were turning the ship around and had fallen asleep. And he claimed he never heard the tannoy because the ship was getting ready to leave harbour. So he didn't go to his post. The first officer who was on the car deck didn't bother checking that the boatswain was there, just assumed that he was, and he went off to other duties. So the bow door was left open. So the ship actually sailed with the bow doors open. The captain had no idea because there were no lights or signals on the bridge where the captain is. There's no warning system to let him know the doors were wide open. So he just assumed they'd been closed as normal and away they went and the ship turned over. So it's very easy to blame those people. You know, they should have closed the doors. They didn't, it's their fault, close the file. But no. The inquiry discovered that there was a problem with towns in Torreson with the culture of safety or lack of safety within the company. In fact, this was not the first time that a ship had left harbour with the bow doors open. But luckily, nothing had happened, but it had been reported. They'd done nothing about it. In fact, captains had asked for warning lights to be fitted on the bridge so they could confirm the, door, the doors were closed. But the company dismissed those requests, and they weren't expensive. They dismissed them as being frivolous. Their argument was they weren't going to spend money on equipment to show that employees were failing to do their job correctly. In other words, that's the captain's job. You're the one meant to sort it out. You check they're doing it correctly. You don't need fancy lights for doing that. And they ignored them. Had they had a warning light, this wouldn't have happened. They also found there was poor communication between management on shore side and the crews, the managers, the captains on the ships. They just did not cooperate, they did not get on, things weren't always done. And I think what really shows the lack of safety culture within that company from top to bottom was the criticism of a chap called Terence Ailing, who was a bosun, again a sort of junior officer. He was the last person to leave the car deck and he saw that the car deck, that the car door was open. The bridge had the bow hadn't been closed up. Surprisingly, it's rather strange in a way. He actually got an award for his bravery during the rescue. But he was asked by the inquiry, well, if you saw the bow door was open and you're the last person on the car deck because people don't stay down there for safety reasons, why didn't you tell somebody? And his answer, well, it wasn't my job. So I just did what I had to do. So that typified how the company viewed safety. It's not my job. I do what I have to do and that's it. Okay, had he done so, maybe a lot of lives would have been saved. So, what the examples are demonstrating is that it's very easy, but potentially very unjust to argue it's just human error is causing the problem. Yes, the people made mistakes, but it's not just down to them, it's down to fundamental problems within the company management structures, the way they do things. For example, you can have inadequate or outdated training. That first officer, American Airlines, he'd not been trained properly. It wasn't his fault. Lack of communication and rivalry between departments. How many times do departments know about something which is maybe safety critical, but aren't gonna tell anybody it's not our problem, let them work it out. We don't get on with that. We don't talk to team B, let them work it out. You know, it's gonna, things are gonna go wrong. Management systems being based on assumptions which are never tested. Airbus assumed that American Airlines had appreciated the problem with the 
with the rudder. And American Airlines, they assumed that their pilot training syllabus was in line with Airbus requirements, but nobody actually correlated these two and double check what's going on. So because there were assumptions being made, wrong information got through. And you've got reluctance to spend time or money on necessary improvements. <laughs> now, the captain's asked for a simple light on the bridge so we can check that the door has been closed. Somebody pushes a button to say the door's closed. Oh, no, we don't need to do that. Just go do your job. Had they had that light, it may never have happened. So the problem is senior management have got to then look at these situations and go, actually, it's not the chap the sharp end has caused the problem maybe we caused the problem because we didn't do our job properly you know when companies talk about lessons will be learned they've got to be it's very easy to say but they've got to mean it and they've got to have the courage and the integrity to look at what the investigation comes up with and then actually say yeah you're right we fell down we didn't get this right and we put these people in an impossible situation so rather than blame them actually so come back to us we for whatever reason we made assumptions we made errors without realizing but it all cumulatively caused a problem we've got to sort it out that requires courage that requires integrity that's the challenge that faces management following an incident getting to the real heart of the problem. Don't just blame the poor operator. You know, it's not necessarily his fault. So let's just summarize. I said, this is a very big topic and we've only scratched the surface of it, but yeah, I hope you see the importance of it. I hope some important points have come through. But just to summarize, so the role of senior management it's more than just deciding who's going to run the investigation and give them some resources and then wait for the report to arrive. The senior management team have got to get involved from beginning to end. They've got to look at the design and development of the investigation framework. Make certain it's there when you need it, you press the button and you've got the resources will switch on. They've got to help the investigation team but without getting in the way or trying to take over. They've got to respond to the findings of the investigation, even though they may find it unpalatable, what they're being told. And then they've got to identify and then correct any underlying flaws. To, so they're protecting the company and they're protecting the workforce. If they can do all that, the investigation that actually proves something. Anyway, that's me. I, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. So it's one of a number which I've been asked to do for Dual Hour, so which I thoroughly enjoyed doing. If, having heard what I've said here, that's struck a chord with you and you think I can help you or your organization, then there's my email address. Um, please drop me a line. I'll be happy to chat to you in confidence, of course. But apart from that, I see Karim has appeared as if by magic. So I'll say thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. And obviously, questions, I'll do what I can. So over to you, Karim. Thank you. So, uh, Julie, if we have any questions yet or not? Yes, we do. We have two so far. <clears throat> One of them's quite long, so I'll try and read it out correctly. Having been involved in two NAD investigations, the client refused to allow me to assign any medical professionals to cover the medical investigation and lead the appropriate questions. How would you assign a medical professional to an investigation team and what position and authority would you give to them? That's from Mark. Interesting point. I mean, if the client said, on the one hand, we want you to investigate, but you may not look at the medical side, which could be crucial, then without going into details, I don't know whether I, I'm not aware of the details of the case, but I would suggest that the poor investigator is not hiding to nothing because crucial information is being hidden from him. So how on earth can he come up with a solution? 
And he can suggest, I want to bring in a medical investigator or a medical specialist and so on. But if the client's not going to cooperate, then I would suggest, and I'm, I'm open to correction here if there's more evidence appears, but on the face of it, I would suggest that that company is wasting its time and its money. It's asking for an investigation, but it doesn't want to help with the investigation. I think it's just hoping, potentially, I may be wrong, but maybe it's just hoping that the investigator will come up with something which looks good on paper and then they can all carry on with business. So I, he has my sympathies, but I don't think you can't get anywhere if you can't do the job properly and go where the evidence leads you. I hope that helps. Thanks, Andy. That was a really comprehensive um, answer. And um, the next question is from Mohammed. Who should follow up the corrective actions from the investigation? Yeah, well, this is what happened. This should go back to the senior management team. That's one of the jobs of the um, the nominated senior manager, that he will take the findings from the lead investigator and he then presents them to the board, if you like, and he acts as the champion of that investigation. And then it's up to the board, the senior team, to listen carefully to what's being said and then decide what actions need to be taken. So. It just follows automatically from the team to senior manager to the management team, if necessary, to the board of directors. Okay, thank you. I don't have any more questions. Kareem, do you have any questions for Andy? Uh, yes, for me, I, I, I need to ask one question to you, Andy. Uh, I think you like a, a step for all the, the steps for uh, all the role for the senior manager from the starting of the selection and how to activate the team and how to support them and how to verify the results. But regarding to now, if, if, I, if I'm like, the, as you said, the nominated senior manager, when I'm presenting the results to the rest of the senior management regarding yeah. to the incident, one of the most important issue as the manager, like uh, when they like, uh, regarding to the root causes of the accidents, they prefer mainly to go to the human errors. They didn't uh, like they didn't prefer that the accident is like for the management failures. Uh, right. Mainly, yeah. So how 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 this rule or how can how can he support you or how can they do this rule? Yeah. Yeah, I mean this is the problem. If this if the people at the top aren't prepared to listen to the real answers and just simply want to find somebody to blame, close the file, move on, that that's a cultural thing, you know, a culture as in business culture. And they've got to understand, maybe they should do some health and safety training of their own, which all managers are meant to do anyway, and start to understand why academics are saying like like Decker are saying that human error is a is a false premise it doesn't actually work you know it's very simple to label something but just labeling it doesn't solve anything and if you're going to go around just blaming people a the staff will lose confidence in you and won't cooperate and b that problem's going to come back because you haven't fixed it you put a sticking plaster on it but it's still going to break down again. If you really want to fix it, look at what the system failures are and fix those. Embarrassing though it may be. Okay, so did you have any any other questions, Julie, or not? No more questions, no. So thank you everyone for uh, attending our branch meeting. And as I said, feel free to bring on your wider network who wanted to be educated, give them the opportunity to learn and to attend our future branch events. Also, I would like to thank you, Andy, for accepting our invitation for today's meeting and for speaking on this fascinating series. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I like it. Thank you for Kareem. Um, just to let everyone know, it'll be a couple of days before the recording goes up on the YouTube channel, but it will be there by Friday. So thank you, Andy. Thank you, Kareem. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Good evening. Thanks. Goodbye, folks. Bye.